Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully, everybody had a good weekend. I know we're still in the middle of all this, but uh, we'll we'll get through it. And uh, if anybody obviously needs anything, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call at CRT. We're we're here to help out. Also, if you're feeling sick, not feeling well, obviously, please get a hold of nine one one or go to your hospital. Just take uh, good cautionary steps and. Uh, We'll get through this. Um, good morning again. My name is Brent Palmer. I'm with uh, CRST Services and I am the manager of measurement technology. And we are in the middle of a series of videos and live podcasts that are just going over principles of uh, measurement and electronics as it relates to the oil and gas industry. We're gonna get into some uh, specific equipment as we move down the line. We'll go into the Floex series of flow computers, but we're going to keep things generic starting off um, as we go through the first series of uh, how equipment works and signals and those type of things. So today we've got a, a really good topic for you, which is on uh, meter pulses and uh, digital input basics. So I'm going to look real quick. We've got uh, some more people coming in. Um, and we'll admit everybody in there coming in. So if you've got questions or anything, Lawandra is moderating, uh, and watching everything. So just type them down or at the end, go ahead and turn on your audio and we'll get them in. And uh, if I can answer any questions, I'll get them answered for you. If I can't answer the questions, we'll find somebody who can. So let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna go on uh, meter pulses and digital basics. So what are digitals? Well, uh, digital basically is an input that we bring into the devices, whether it's a PLC or a flow computer or any other type of device where we're looking at a signal. And with that signal, we're looking for a rise and fall of the voltage to determine that it is a, a valid signal coming in. So if I think about uh, where I would use these digital signals, I may use them uh, as inputs to view a pump running or a pump not running. I may uh, use them for communications. 232, 45 communications is digital based. So based upon highs and lows of digital signals and inside of computers at a, a really a small voltage level, we are looking at digital signals on and off, on and off. And that's basically what these signals are. So with this, with these digital signals, we're looking at uh, going over a threshold or below a threshold at specific voltages. And what you'll find is each manufacturer can have a specific voltage that they're looking for that digital signal to go above and below to count as a signal. Now that signal could be a meter pulse. Again, it could be a pump running. It could be a momentary for a signal to do something, let's say a momentary push button, something like that. But we need to see it go above a threshold voltage. And we'll get into the threshold voltages, but what I want to go to a little bit is uh, what these digital signals are and what, what a digital output is. Digital output is just, let's say, coming off the, the device that uh, sending us the, the digital output. It's a signal, again, typically that's high or low, and it's telling us an on, off, or something like that. So it's uh, these signals that we're using in logic functions inside PLCs or inside of computers, or it's just status, status functions that we're using um, coming off different devices. So, give me one second here. So let's talk about turbine and PD meters. And for those of you that are not familiar with turbine meters, if we think of turbine meter, if you look at your, your standard, uh, let's say, fan at the house, it has blades on it. And those blades, each one of them is typically made out of metal. And again, I'm generalizing a lot here because there's all different kinds of turbine meters. Some of them have a ring that goes around them and they have magnetic buttons on them. Others, the blades are slightly different, but the basic principle in them all is the same. I've got a blade and this blade in the pipe, as fluid goes through it, it spins it around just like my, my air fan would. Well, sitting um, on the pipe, we also have a magnet. And that magnet, uh, the tip of it, is basically looking and it's being distorted each time that blade passes by it. So if you look at the, the images that I have up there on a simple turbine, 
what happens is as the blade gets closer, we see a rise in the signal. And as the blade goes farther away, we see a dip in the signal. And every time a blade comes, we see this signal. And it creates a sine wave. Now, one of the difficulties in a sine wave coming off of a meter is that you can see it's not really straight. It takes a while for the voltage threshold to come through. And we like to see really crisp, straight up and down signals in digital worlds to, to say that it's on off, not slowly coming on and slowly coming off. So in this case, we have this, this magnetic pickup coil that's giving us this sine wave. And this sine wave is a very, very low voltage, um, millivolts of voltage. So it's not gonna make our voltage threshold either. We're gonna to have to go through a device that's gonna take this sine wave and increase the amplitude of it, make it a higher voltage, but then also we wanna see it more of a, a digital signal. So before we get there, basically inside this turbine meter, we have some components. And what happens is as fluid comes in, it comes in from, let's say in this case, left to right, but it can go by directionally. And what it's doing is it's moving that rotor that's in the center. This is our fan or rotor inside. And that rotor is on two, rides on two bearings. And what happens is there's a space between the downstream and the upstream cones. And as that blade starts spinning around, it's actually gonna find a little bit of equilibrium between the, the two cones. So it's almost like it's floating inside there. And it's spinning around and every time one of those blades passes by that magnetic tip, it creates the, uh, the sine wave. If we're using a PD meter, a positive displacement meter, and there's a couple different uh, variations here. The one on the left is what they call a birotor. So fluid is coming in from the left and there are uh, sections that the fluid is pushing through and the, uh, the birotor basically is uh, two spinning sections and they're like a corkscrew and the fluid's pushing them through. And we know that every time that one of those blades passes by that magnetic pickoff, it's gonna again, start a sine wave that, come, that comes out of there. And there's so much fluid in there. So we derive a K factor basically. And we say that every time that blade passes by, we're gonna have so much fluid go by. Turbine meter the same way. Every time we see a signal, we know that so much fluid has gone by. And it's a case of where you have thousands of signals that come in or thousands of pulses for us to generate, uh, that meter to generate basically a barrel of movement. The other one, uh, the orange one, is a positive displacement meter, but it's got rotary veins inside of it. So what happens is when fluid comes in on the left, there's actually a section and we know what the size of that section is of how much fluid that can hold. And it's a little bit oblong and what happens is you have these, these veins that push up along the, the sidewall. The fluid pushes them around and once they're exactly in the section in the middle here where the fluid cannot escape, I can't put more fluid into this section or take fluid out, we'll actually measure and send a signal out for one pulse. And then the, move, the vein moves around, it releases that fluid in, and obviously this is going incredibly fast, and these are, are very well-tuned machines, meters, so there, there's very little resistance in there. It's not like you're causing a lot of back pressure. So we've got these, these different meter types that are all producing this sine wave coming out, and we wanna turn that sine wave into a square wave. So a lot of times what we're using is a preamplifier. So in this case, this is a Smith PA6 preamplifier. There's Daniel's 1818As. There's a bunch of uh, signal conditioners or preamplifiers that are taking this really low voltage AC waveform coming in, the sine wave, and then converting it to a square wave that has both uh, an amplitude to it. And it's uh, a little bit crisper, obviously, for us to be able to count. So most cases, if I'm not getting something off the meter, I can go take a look. And if I take a uh, handheld physical meter with me to, to the meter and come right off those pickoff, that magnet, I am gonna see a frequency coming off of it. If I have a scope, I'll see this sine wave at a very low voltage. And I can see if I have that at one side of my preamp. Out of the preamp, I should then see the square wave. And that square wave, I should see a voltage across uh, on it where I should see that this, let's say from peak to peak would be 
seven and a half volts or 12 volts or 24 volts, depending on the type of preamp that you're using and a frequency coming off of that too. Because a frequency isn't necessarily a sine wave. A frequency is how many uh, pulses or how many counts, pulses counts, that I'm seeing in a period of time, in this case, a second. So we, a lot of times we create a frequency to this sine wave up here, but really it's, it's just a count of how many cycles are inside of roughly a second. So when this signal comes in, what we're looking at is, again, we're looking for a voltage threshold. I have to know that this thing has gone above a certain voltage to even count it as a signal because when we really drill down deep into these signals at times, you can see in the gray that we may have a distortion. Well, I obviously don't wanna count all of this as a signal. I wanna make sure that it goes above my threshold and then back below my threshold, and that's what I'm gonna count as a signal. So as soon as I peek past the, the threshold here, you see I go from an off state to an on state. So the off and on state, when I look at that, can be off and on counts as a pulse from a meter, and off and on counts, again, as a pump starting or a run indication. It, it can be many different things. It can happen quite frequently, too. So in the case of a pump, obviously, it's going to happen once, and it may happen again uh, from off to on, and it may stay on for hours and then turn itself back off. As we're in the case of a meter, it may be doing this 5,000 times in a second. So very, very quickly. But this voltage threshold, most equipment, has a setting for what voltage threshold it needs to see. It's adjustable because not all signals are going to be coming in at the same voltage. Each manufacturer of meters may have a different voltage threshold that they've set their, their devices up to. So it's adjustable typically in the flow computers or in other devices, and it may be adjustable either by a software setting or there may be uh, jumpers that you have to change in order to change that voltage threshold. But again, the key here is I need to be able to see that transition on the voltage threshold. And a lot of times what we have riding on these signals is an induced voltage. So what happens is I never really get down to my common or my zero volts or my reference voltage. And that reference voltage is what do I think the bottom is? What's my low signal? What, am, what is zero to me? Or again, the bottom signal. If I have something induced on that, it may actually be that that, that bottom signal is five volts. Well, if I'm sitting up at, and I've got a 10 volt signal here and my threshold is five volts, but yet I don't get below five volts when I go to my low signal, then I'm never gonna see a transition back to a high. I have something induced on there. So a lot of times what happened, the way that this can happen is two different power supplies and a signal that I'm getting a signal from another device and we have not bonded the commons on the power supply together. So we try to bond the commons on the power supply to make sure that we're at the same reference voltage for our low. And then when we go through the threshold, we'll actually see our high. And that's a little confusing at times, but it's what happens is again, a lot of what I see in the field is we have two different pieces of equipment from, let's say, even two different companies, one being the customer, the other one being the uh, supplier on a pipeline system. And they're trying to share a signal, but they're using two different power supplies and those power supplies aren't bonded. So I have two different points of reference for my zero. Portable provers, this runs into a lot of problems with and a lot of portable equipment that we may bring in to do some diagnostics or calibration. We can see this happen a lot. So with outputs, we have a couple different type of outputs when we're outputting a uh, digital output. One of them is we have uh, what we call an active output where we're actually supplying the voltage. And that voltage then is going out to a device to be uh, measured. And really we can think of an active uh, output kind of like a, uh, a light switch where we're switching the power. That here, we've got an external power supply on our right-hand side, and we have to have a reference. So on the, the left-hand side, we have our negative, and the device is sitting on one side of that. It's measuring what our, our reference is. And then we've got, uh, I believe this is a common to ground, so our common to ground here. On the other side, we're taking, let's just say 24 volts. 
And that 24 volts is our supply voltage going to, in this case, uh, could be a relay, it could be a switch. And this is in the open position right now, the circuit's broken. But when we close that circuit, we're gonna supply 24 volts and the device is gonna measure 24 volts sitting here in reference to its common. So the, the signal is considered active because the voltage resides on the signal. Another form of output that we have or that we're reading as an input is called an open collector where basically we don't have a voltage on there. It's still similar to a solid state where we're gonna make a switch, but we're not supplying the, uh, the high voltage or the, the uh, active voltage on here. What we're doing is we're actually switching our reference to common. So if I was putting a relay into the circuit and I wanted to pull a relay in, I would take one side of it to 24 volts to one side of the coil for the relay. The other side I would bring as the, the input or the output from this device. And when this switches, this is basically going to give me the common and that's going to complete my circuit, pulling my relay, and then I'm able to see my digital. So what you'll see is a lot of devices provide a passive open collector output um, and the switch still goes uh, off and on. And, uh, but there's just no voltage, excuse me, there's no voltage applied to the switch. So, not at the question point yet, we're almost there. I just wanted to kind of show how we set up in some devices these digitals and what the threshold means. So I'm gonna go into a flow computer and I'm gonna go specifically into a module and we'll go in and we'll set up a, a digital. So these digitals, in this case, this is a uh, limit switch and the signal coming in is set up as a digital input now, polarity means that this signal can be normally high or it can be normally low. So in the case of a limit switch, a lot of these safety switches, what you want to do is you always want to have the, the limit switch giving you the voltage. So I always want to see that the switch is made. And when, the, the, when it goes high, then it breaks that signal. And when it breaks that signal, I consider that a high level. And then I can go ahead and shut something down. If the switch malfunctions or if I lose voltage to the circuit, I'll also see a voltage drop and I'll shut the system down. So it's a safety system. It has to be active in order for me to do something. And if I see it break, whether it's because the, the volume inside of a container or, or a tank has gone high, then I'm breaking that and I'm losing my voltage. Or in the case of a, a, a failure of whatever supplying that voltage, I'll also lose that voltage. But my logic may say that that switch doesn't need to be high. So I can invert what I'm looking at. And when I invert it, what I'm saying is a high voltage actually means to me a low logic. It's off. So the switch isn't made. Even though I'm seeing 24 volts, I determine that the switch isn't made. So once that switch breaks and my voltage goes to zero because I'm inverted, that actually becomes a one in my logic. So it's a way of me inverting my logic to look at a signal state coming in but we'll just keep it normal. I talked about the voltage thresholds. So in this case, for these digitals, you have the ability to select whether that voltage needs to break the 1.25 volt plane or whether it needs to go all the way up to 12 volts to break that plane. And the reason why we may select these different voltages is in this case, if it only has to break 1.25, there are times that maybe it doesn't go down below 1.25 but the signal is a 24 volt signal. So I can set it to 12 volts and say, hey, listen, uh, go above 12 volts, I'm good, get all the way up to 24, and I'm normally gonna drop below. But in some cases, if I set this up, let's say for a, a preamp or a, some of the meter pulses coming out, if my voltage input threshold level is 12 volts, but I'm only ever putting out a maximum of seven volts on that signal, then I'm never gonna see that signal. So I have to drop it down to 1.25 volts. The digital one input latch mode, what this means is, do I wanna look at the actual condition or do I wanna latch it? And, and what happens is flow computers and some of the other devices, they're on a calculation cycle. So those calculation cycles, let's say are a half a second. Well, what happens if I have a digital go high and then low in less than a half second? Well, when I come through and I look at the status of that digital, I either wanna see whether it's actually high 
in low, and I'll use my logic based upon the actual state it is when I do my scan, or I can latch it, and if it goes high-low, I'll keep it high until I scan through and record it as being high in that cycle, and then I'll release it to whatever state that it's in. Now, on the digital outputs, what we do is we can set up a time where we have an activation time. So right now it's set to 10 milliseconds. If I think about when I'm doing a sampler and, and some of the samplers have mechanical uh, switches on them or mechanical sample probes that have a certain amount of activation time. So if I just send out a 10 millisecond signal, which is incredibly fast, that doesn't give that piston time to be energized and fully extend out and fully retract back once I release the signal. So the extension time for that piston to go fully out may be a second and a half. So what I need to do is I would set that activation time to 1500 milliseconds. So I make sure that I hold that signal long enough for that piston to fully stroke. Or I may be going to another device that is a prover launch or something else. And I want to set that signal up a little bit longer so I can make sure that that end device sees the state of it before I drop it low. The last thing I can set is a output delay time. Maybe I don't want that signal to go out immediately. I want to wait a certain number of seconds before I send that signal out. Um, and I may do that to delay opening or closing the valve based upon something else in the logic here. But that's all these, these few different settings are. And basically that's, that's it for, for digitals on inputs and outputs. They're, they're pretty simplistic. Again, we're looking for a voltage to go high above a threshold. And when we see that, we consider that true or on. And when it goes below that threshold, we consider that uh, low or off. And we use that within our logic to count the number of times that happens or to say a status is running or not, or even in the case of communications, to make that a zero or one and turn that into a hexadecimal value based upon the, uh, the length of the signal and also the number of signals I see within a certain time period. So pretty simple. Uh, if you have a good meter and if you're looking at pulses, you kind of want to have a scope also so you can see what the uh, signal actually looks like. But it's, it's not real complicated. We're, we're again, good reference to, uh, to ground or to common. And we uh, bond our, our power supplies together. And typically, we won't have too many problems with, uh, with these signals. So are there any questions I can answer? Let's see. Oh, I got good mornings. Excellent. All right. Well, this video is going to be posted up to our YouTube channel. If, uh, if you're searching for our videos, you can go to uh, on YouTube, look for the CRT services channel, and uh, all the videos that we're doing are up within a few hours afterwards. If you have any questions or if you have any uh, topics you want to go over, please let me know. If you want to be a presenter for these series, please also let me know. We're looking for guest presenters to do uh, gas and some other functions, and uh, we look forward to uh, speaking with you guys next time that we, uh, we have our next session. And again, if there's anything we can answer, any questions that you may have, don't hesitate to uh, give us a shout over here at CRT Services and uh, hope everybody has a good day and stay safe. Thank you.